So this is the second week now. So we've completed the first week. Um, you've kind of got settled into London. You've got settled into the college. You kind of know where things are. You've got used to the workshop. Um, so you can see how we kind of operate. And then, so the, the kind of first, kind of not first, but the second lecture I would do is, is this. It's something around materials. And I was talking to Gunhill on the way over. And this changes, what I include each year changes. Because when I first did it, it was quite a formal thing. That was kind of, these are the things you need to know for the next three years. And maybe your future practice. Um, but it was like any list, or it's like anything. How do you actually bring it to life? So, Julia's pointing at me going this way. All yeah, oh, right. Um, so it's always that thing about how do, you, how do we get students to learn this information? Because you will have all had, those people who've done ceramics, you will all have had a very different experience of this. And some of you would have been expecting the science behind the subject or underpinning the subject. And for about three of our students, that's really interesting. For the other 32, it's like, what, what did I come here for? So in one way, this, this is meant to, mm, didn't like that, did it? Yeah, something's not happening with the slideshow. But this is normally just a rolling show of when they're coming into the room, these slides, and I'll show you all of them, these slides are just rolling. So they're, as they're sitting down, they're getting, starting to kind of see this new vocabulary. And so it isn't a shock when we start using the, termino the terminology and kind of we've used it in the first week, but the second week, they're already getting familiar with some of these words. So this is just rolling very gently as you come down, come into the room, you sit down, take your place. Uh, and just start picking out certain words, really. And certain words aren't going to come into use maybe for two years. But as they see these words, um, and the particular layout, the way I've kind of designed it, was to make people not read a chunk of information, but it's kind of that sentence. And also today, what I'd love is any kind of feedback that helps to improve this or things that you do, because this is just one example of how we introduce um, the subject. Yeah? Any questions so far about this? Sorry? No, it's, it's for some reason the time has gone on it. But normally it would just gently, 11 seconds, you'd have to read each one of these. So it was for um, a performance I was doing in a gallery in, called Messums, which you may have heard of. It's becoming very well known now in the UK as a kind of a real centre of kind of excellence for ceramic exhibitions. Um, they've got a, a central gallery in um, Cork Street in London, and they've also got this amazing barn in Wiltshire. Um, and so just check out Messam's gallery, because they're having some really interesting exhibitions. Um, and this was to communicate to a non-ceramic audience to kind of introduce the materials. They knew they were coming to kind of hear about material and materiality. Um, so is there anything you'd like to add to that? We need to think of a Z, don't we? You need to think? Yeah, I haven't I don't know where it's ended. It's like pff. the other one is fuller, but yeah. So I'm gonna close that. So that was meant to be just the gentle kind of introduction. So this idea, this inquiry question, what on earth is clay? And for those people who've made a few things with it, we have students come in with very different experience. This is the first time they will have touched clay, like last week. And so how do you get them kind of involved in this kind of idea that we are a community of practice? So it's, it's based around lots of different white powders, generally, uh, materials, um, particularly within glaze formulation. 
and obviously temperature. What is going on here? Don't know. Um, so this idea about a new vocabulary. So within the first month or so, they're going to hear quite a few words um, that they've just never come across. And we say it's up to them, we're not going to explain everything, but it's up to them to really go away after something that we expect them to take notes and actually to come back with questions. So it's always that thing about not just giving, but we want to encourage questions. So some things are quite oblique and we can, we can kind of figure out if it's working if they come back and ask questions about that. So we've just had a kind of test of, of some of those slides at the beginning. Um, and what I purposely haven't done with this, I've taken out a few slides that I had because Knut's in his talks have, has given ex, you know, amazing kind of glaze information. So I've taken some of those things out. Um, How many of these words are you all familiar with? Where's Nuno? Nuno, that familiarity with these words, or are they all a bit strange? <laughs> and then we come to a quote by Wed Josiah Wedgwood. Beautiful forms and compositions are not made by chance. So we're starting to introduce this kind of idea of a design process. That yeah, we can, we can all play with clay, um, we can all engage with it on a very tactile, kind of haptic um, sensibility, but actually, what are you going to be doing on the course? And this first thing about understanding the materials and a real base level. This used to be three or four slides, but what I found was that students weren't engaging with it so it's like how do you edit and I'm not a great believer in editing information but if it's your second lecture and it's a very dry thing and it's lots of information lots of facts and figures how how are those students are actually going to kind of use that information so again with students in mind and I say this has changed over the years but this idea about kind of what it goes through um, and the classifications of things and what we talk about, earthenware for me starts once you have this transformation. Um, and you read different things in different books. But for me, once it's turned into ceramic, we can kind of class it as earthenware. And then the idea of stoneware, many books that I read was around 1180. And we know the reason for that is that most materials at 1180, they're going to survive, they're going to, you know, some will fall away, some will melt, but anything over that starts to become classed as stoneware. So it's this idea of classification. Where do we get these words from? And what I always say to students, earthenware is like the earth, it's soft, it's kind of porous in that sense. Once we get into stoneware, it's like stone and where clay has come from. Um, and then what, what we've got there is kind of 1200 and above. So for me, that's the classification now. Um, I just use 573, everything from there, earthenware, um, through to kind of bisque, and again, understanding that idea about bisque temperatures, that first firing, um, and then everything above 1200 for me is stoneware, and then you obviously start getting into porcelain. So that thing about earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain, which we know is a very different kind of clay. And one of those questions from the students was, okay, does clay ever melt? What happens? And so you start to talk about volcanoes and magma, kind of where we think of, you know, the, the earth creating this material. Um, and so I realized I wasn't actually talking about clay melting very much until sort of five or six years ago. Um, and as we can see from uh, the next set of slides, then yeah, it really does melt. Um, but getting across to students as well about this idea about the firing ranges 
and the particular temperatures they may find value in for them, depending on what it is that they are producing. Um, and the reason I've put that in the idea about digging your own clay, because I come onto that a little bit later. Um, so most clays will go to liquid above kind of um, 1300 or so, but as low as 1120. I've had some clays that I've dug that are 1000, they just start to distort. So it depends what's in that when you dig it. Um, and then now, depending on, and again, you as departments will all have variations, but for us, the two most common firing temperatures that we find in the department, and this is a, over 100 students, is in 1060 and 1250. Um, any common firing temperatures from your departments? Gunhill, Knut? So we basically use those. Yeah. Those are the most common now. Yeah. I actually have a little lower. Yeah, 10 degrees lower. Than those 10 degrees lower, so 1050. You know those clays which are some that one, yes. Yeah. Those clays which are melting around 1200, they can still be. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting, there's a book now on 1240 glazes. So looking at how do we lower, because we know after a certain temperature, it costs so much more to get that kiln going up to stoneware. So that thing about anything we can do to reduce that is for the better. I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, we've got a whole wall you may have seen above the kiln room that are all as a wall of kind of really interesting slabs basically, but it's where all the, the objects have melted. So understanding how much that costs when that happens, when it goes into the elements and it bites into the kiln brick, how much does that cost to actually repair that? So yes, we expect students to take risk, but kind of controlled risk in that sense of understanding that this thing, if you don't pay attention to the temperature you're firing at, with the appropriate clay, because we have earthenware slip casting um, clay as well as stoneware and also porcelain. So kind of understanding that is really important. And what I say again, and I'll stop saying that because you are in your second week, um, are two questions you'll, leave, you know, you'll hear a lot and you'll ask others in years to come is what's the clay what temperatures it fired to. Any other standard questions out there? So when you're going around an exhibition or you're going to a degree show or whatever it is, often it's those two things. Did you mean it to come out like that? <laughs> that's, a, that's another one, definitely, yeah. Any others? Are you going to glaze it? <laughs> are you going to glaze it, yeah. When, when, when are you going to finish it? Yeah, so that kind of thing about... And this idea about sharing information, um, you know, we expect to be asked what our glaze recipe is. But what I do tell students, don't forget that, that maker who've, who's reached this position in their career, it could have taken them 30 years to perfect that particular glaze with that work. So are you expecting every single bit of information? And particularly when it's a very blunt question. But I always say that if you show some interest or some prior knowledge about this person's work, maybe they will get in a conversation. And yes, they may well give you their results because often we know within this practice and part of this project is actually about sharing this hard won knowledge. Um, so for me, that's really important just to make students very aware straight away that it's key to understanding what it takes to get to that position. Um, of excellence. Uh, and you can read that if you want to, but stuff, this idea that this stuff that we live with and is around us, um, and it's a, a, a common phrase now, but in ceramics we know it's extreme shorthand to describe the science, materials, techniques, processes, knowledge and understanding for the subject. But we kind of wrap it up in this stuff involved in ceramics. Um, but it really matters. Um, that's the thing that they're gonna learn over three years. And it is one of the world's most abundant materials. 
Life on Mars, clay on Mars. Any idea? Yes. <laughs> there you go, Emma. Uh, yeah, that's why rovers up there at the moment, Curiosity, the rover on Mars, is collecting data of clay samples. Um, one student said, so when are we going to see the samples? I said, they ain't coming back. It's going to take a while to get those samples back. But the data is coming back. And the data is coming back to somebody linked with our course through Clayground. Um, a company I run, Javier Cuadros, who's got the arrow in his head there. He is the Natural History Museum's clay mineralogist and geologist. So any question about clay, uh, he has the answer and willing to share everything he knows in an, on an afternoon. So I rang him the first time and said, Javier, could you spare like half an hour of your precious time? He said, have you got an afternoon? I said, yeah, brilliant. So he's just somebody at the Natural History Museum who loves sharing his knowledge of clay. In fact, so much so, um, he's worked with Clayground to write an article for the Crafts Council, which is now in their archive, about the science of clay. <coughs> and that idea that his research covers clay on Earth, but elsewhere in the solar system, uh, not just on Mars, is extraordinary. But that's telling us so much information about how this planet formed. So where does this stuff come from? Um, bless you. We know it starts as rock, and over millennia, millions and millions of years, it ends up through a process where it forms into clay. And kind of understanding that weathering action um, and hydrolysis to form clay minerals and those kind of main bodies, kaolinites and smesites, um, are two of the four kind of main groups. And that's one of Javier's favourite photographs from the planet Earth, kind of seeing this formation of kind of weathered rock coming down into more water to then um, create these ultra-fine particles. Because I said, have you, got, have you got one picture that you'd happily share? He said, one, I've got like <laughs> lots. I said, but give me just one that kind of for you kind of explains just in a snapshot um, about where clay comes from. And that was the one. Um, that was another photograph he was super excited by because he said within that small cliff, you're seeing the whole process happen from rock to clay. So these are, these are Javier's photographs. Um, but he's, you know, I'm constantly looking for things where students will just get it straight away, that it's kind of shorthand, rather than actually explaining the whole process. Because hopefully if they're interested, they'll go away and do it. So this gives us an opportunity to talk about water and clay and the recycling process. So it immediately starts to kind of visually communicate what's water like without, you know, what's clay like without the water. So you think that's close up? This gets even closer. So the electron microscope. So that idea about why is clay so malleable. Why does it move? And once you see it at 10,000 times magnification, you start to see these flat platelets. So these things that slide, there's nothing jagged about them. They're not going to stop. They're just doing this. So the idea that as we manipulate clay, it's going to slide. And 
That's what clay is. When you simplify it right down, a basket of minerals distinguished by small particle size, composition and crystalline structure, hydrolysis, aluminum, phyllosilicates. That is condensed from four pages of information. So if you were interested as a student, you'd go away and go, okay, what are these minerals in here? How does it get to that small size? What is this? And what I'm trying to do is lead people into that information rather than just give it all in one big shot or several big shots. This is what it looks like when you hand uh, one of our professors, Rob Kessler, um, who is very well known for his um, photographs which have been photoshopped on pollen. So Rob's work is everywhere. He's got three or four um, books on the subject. But it, I kind of asked him as a commission, have you looked at clay under the microscope? And it was like, uh, no, I haven't actually. And he'd been involved in the subject for 50 years. So it's great to give him this kind of commission to produce these. And this is a diatom. This is at 10,000 times magnification. And apparently he, he leapt when he found this in the clay particles, uh, which is a diatom which is covered in silica. Um, he'd just never seen one before. He'd read about them, but he'd never seen one. So it was, it was so excited when he brought these photographs back to show me what he'd found in the clay. Um, and then also this amoeba. Um, and what Rob does expertly is to colour, to use Photoshop, to give these black and white X-ray photographs some kind of meaning. Um, so when he's dealing with pollen, he'll introduce the colours that the flower produces. Um, and obviously those questions about, is it really like, no it isn't, it's just black and white. So it's his colour additions that really bring these things to life. And again, more clay particles. So for, and again, you can't get a precise answer on this, no matter how I've tried. It always starts, one subsection becomes several subsections. Um, but just knowing that they've been kind of classified, I find fascinating. And hopefully students do, if they start to look into it, understand a bit more that it doesn't just come straight out of a bag from a supplier. Because when you say to students, where does clay come from? They go, uh, out of a bag. Yeah, but before that, um, so trying to get that information across is difficult. Um, and knowing there are 30 different types of pure clays. Um, there's our map. Uh, and there's Stoke-on-Trent which I don't know how many people have visited. Anybody been to Stoke-on-Trent? Tony Quinn, Emma Lacey. Brilliant. So, yeah, not much, okay, understanding of what Stoke-on-Trent's like. Uh, it's a tough place. Uh, I was born there. But it has a great football team <laughs> who beat Chelsea. Uh, and that's all that matters to me. Um, this is what Stoke-on-Trent used to look like. So any industry forms around the fact that it's obviously it started its industry because of local materials. So before mass transportation, an industry would build up around those local resources. And Stoke had fantastic, the North Midlands coal fields, so very close to the surface, surface coal, uh, and also this red clay, Etruria Mall, that Wedgwood um, called. But this was the 1930s, so we're talking, okay, it's 100 years ago, but that's what Longton kind of looked at. This is where my dad was born, um, and this would have been around the time he was born. And this here, anybody know what these white dots are? What happens to plaster moulds when they've been used 40 or 50 times? Just chucked. Fill it down the hole where you're digging the clay from. So the clay is literally be up that, up that in trucks, pulled up, straight into the potteries, because the potteries literally just dug out the back of their building. So ex excavated these huge marl holes. So Stoke-on-Trent did that. It was extraordinary landscape. 
Uh, and that's what it looked like when 2,000 bottle ovens were firing. So it was this heart of the kind of ceramics industry in Stoke. And around that was also built steelworks uh, and the canal system to import export. Because where Stoke-on-Trent sits, and for Wedgwood to build a factory that was based on import export, he built it in the middle of a landmass. So he was a great supporter of the, in fact, he funded the first canal, um, the Cool Canal, Trent and Mersey. And the Trent and Mersey, the canal system in uh, the UK, basically connects Hull up in the north east with Bristol in the southwest and then the other way so it's a big X with Liverpool with London and it meets in the middle um, below Stoke in Birmingham but it's incredible network that was only act really active for about 75 years until steam came in um, that was where I grew up just over that ridge there but behind was this great play adventure playground when I was growing up. This all in the kind of late 60s started to be leveled off. So once the clean, once the clean air acts came in around the 50s, um, bottle ovens were started to be demolished and basically these where the clay was quarried from at the back of these potteries all started to be filled in with rubble. And so the landscape now in Stoke is very different but Neil Brownsword, I don't know if you know his work, um, in 2009, uh, did an extraordinary film, and I'm hoping this will connect a bit. Oh, uh, I'm not on the internet. No, it won't. The, my, sorry, my laptop won't accept the internet. I'll, I'll, anyway, have a look at, it's a fantastic film. It's half an hour. I was only going to show you a few minutes of it. Um, but he invited nine artists nine makers to come into a marl hole and work for a couple of weeks or I think it was a week but incredible to kind of really respond to the landscape and to make work in there and everybody who came made completely different um, a completely different response to site but a really interesting um, yeah sorry I can't show you that but again I'm happy to write all this stuff down I could do a snapshot of notes for the slideshow so you could have references within that as well and use that. Uh, types of clay bodies. Obviously suppliers respond to demand. Um, pot clay is one of our favorite suppliers. They're literally making it up in an old dome mixer, um, different bodies. So sitting there with just lots of ingredients to order. Um, so you can get all sorts of different bodies made up. They work with makers now will, and they will produce makers' bodies that they've kind of combined and tested over the years. Um, but again, thinking about this classification of materials, earthenware, stoneware, porcelain. So again, just reinforcing that a number of times through the kind of presentation. Um, and understanding that the maturing temperature is different for all these. So that, that again, just that repetition of information. So it's a bit warm in here, folks. It might be the beer or the heat. But, um, and that idea of primary and secondary. So why, why is clay different? Some clays, the primary clays, where they were formed, that's where you find them. Um, secondary clays have been on the move quite a lot. Um, hence the different colours. And the way we think of kind of original deposits are for us in the southwest. Um, in Cornwall, um, Wedgwood, before he discovered these, sent, sent off geologists to America because he'd heard there was white clay there, um, knowing nothing about the geology of kind of the south, uh, southwest until the clay pits were discovered down there and around that time. And that's the landscape. Anybody been to Cornwall? Yeah, a few people have been to Cornwall. Ever seen these? Was in St. Austell? St. Austell. The it. heart of it. It's the heart of it. It's like five, ten minutes out of St. Austell. You come across this extraordinary landscape. 
that has been mined since the late 1700s. If you look at the world and the Kerlin sites, is there a There's about 11. There isn't a pattern as such across. Have you come across a pattern? Can you, I don't know if you ever looked. No. There's no. It doesn't appear so. What's interesting, we were talking to the production um, manager when we were going around the factory and talking about Imri's and their, their clay, their white clay. Um, at this site now, they're on the fourth grade. So the first grade of kaolin is gone. Second, gone. Third, gone. Fourth is where they're at with the, the quality of mining. So that idea about production in the factory that you saw, always kind of this checks and balances, testing those materials because it's an organic material and it's always going to change. Depending on if you dug it from there or there, it's going to be of a different quality. So that idea about kind of finding the next site, and Imri's now a mining in South America to try and find the first grade kaolin, basically. Um, because as we know, kaolin, you know, its use is vast. It's only about 20% of Imri's production, I think, is in ceramics. The rest goes to other industries. Or even, might be even less than 20%. Um, there's some great Pathé News. I don't know if you know Pathé News. It's on YouTube. But some great old films from the kind of 20s, 30s, 40s of kind of, cha uh, of, kind of mining the clay. Again, just getting deep down into that, that mine. Um, the Eden Project, great project, regeneration project. Um, they decided to build it in the bottom of China clay pit, which seemed a really good idea at the time, but they hadn't quite thought about drainage. So what they produced with these amazing, these biospheres here, are incredible plant species. But the whole site after two years became waterlogged because nobody had thought about clay lining canals, lining reservoirs. Obviously it lines the base of this, so the water ain't going anywhere. So the roots, were, they were growing these really tall trees really quickly, but the roots just had no foundation to them. So, they grew, so the atmosphere that it grew in, but no roots to support it. I think they closed for about a year, I don't know if Tony knows, I think they closed for about a year or so to put water extraction is, because the water just sat there, because that's what it does. So these are different world sites about where your material comes from. And what's interesting is the actual mine of it, the production of it, hasn't changed much over 100, 200 years or so. Um, and that, I found that quite amusing, that those kind of images are quite similar in a way. You've still got the individual with a, a kind of crane and a hoist, and you've got similarity going in there, and this kind of idea about wooden bridges connecting, but you've still got these metal ones. So they change, but they're very similar. And you may or may not know the way it's washed out of the cliffs. So these huge, what's called monitors, these massive industrial hoses that just blast, blast rock faces with water. And that just runs down a slurry, which goes into further gullies, which then goes into big drying beds. Um, so if you are over in Cornwall, um, to go to Wheel Martin, which is one of the original um, clay collection places, is just fantastic. Anybody seen this film, Goldmark film, made in China? <laughs> yeah? No? Uh, have a look at his series, Mark Goldmark. I mean, he's, he's kind of one of these characters in ceramics that saw an opportunity. But it's a great opportunity, because he's making really good films of, of really good potters in the UK. Uh, and he's made this one on Takeshi Asuda. Um, in China, and Takeshi takes you around Jing De Zhen on his moped. Uh, it's just a really cool film. It's about an hour, and you can skim through some of it. 
But it's really entertaining. But it, Mark Gomart does these films really well. And it, I think it'd be great. I don't know if we've approached him, Katie. I don't know if we've approached Gomart Films to see if we can at least signpost them on the, on the uh, website. Uh, but these in action, this is Jing De Gen today. This isn't like 100 years ago. This is pounding, pounding porcelain rock because it's, you know, it's hacked out of the Galen Hills. Um, and we think Galen is Kaelin, so that thing about white clay, uh, we think that's where the derivation comes from. Uh, that's me working down there in, in a big clay pit near Birmingham. Um, and we invited people down into the clay pit to make cups and saucers, which I put on canes. So there was lots of bulrushes down there and we had these cups and saucers because this was Dalton's clay pit. Um, and the canal was, was kind of diverted there to collect this particular clay, which is ball clay. What you see there, that dark gray is a coal seam and either side of that is something called fire clay. Do you have those, do you have ball clay and fire clay? Come on, no? No, what do you call them? What do you call ball clay then, I wonder? Ball clay is all the ball clay. It is ball clay. Okay, what about fire clay? Do you have fire clay? Okay. So, ball clay, does anybody know why it was called ball clay? You ceramics people in the room? Great, if we could get that on film, could it? that was brilliant. So it was about transportation. So this clay was rolled into balls, so it was quite wet. They used to wet it down, so it wasn't collected as a powder, it was dug out. It was kind of mined in that way. Um, rolled into balls, hence ball clay. So great kind of bit of action there. Um, but it was just really interesting to identify this particular seam of, of coal that ran through it and getting that kind of um, understanding about, about materials and names. You all know why China clay is called China clay, I'm sure. Oh. Anybody know why China clay is called China clay? You might not know even the material. Katie, do you know what China clay is? It's a white clay. So it's that kaolin, it's the, the similar stuff. But it was because we were looking for an alternative to Chinese porcelain. So we were in Porting Chinese porcelain, and that's why when we found white clay in Cornwall, we just called it China clay. Um, what we asked students to do straight away, second week, and the way the first project um, is kind of taught, is this idea that we want them to consider the ecological impacts of both the extraction of materials through mining and the firing of ceramic, which uses the Earth's finite resources. So we have got a learning outcome that is about sustainable practice. And that goes to their final mark. So they have to consider from day one the materials they are using and actually the implications of using that material. Um, and particularly, you may or may not know, but cobalt is under great scrutiny. Because of its mining practices and child labour in that mining of it, but also now it's priced because of lithium batteries and the way it's used elsewhere. Um, we don't use that much in ceramics. But again, no matter how much you're using, is that understanding about the implications of using it, being aware of that in your practice. So that idea about not wasting materials, not firing clay if it's not um, needed. We will assess non-fired clay. So we'll assess objects at different stages of the process so students don't feel under pressure to fire everything that they're then just going to turn their back on. So you can learn so much from kind of scale. In fact, we've introduced scale into our projects, actual measurements in the first year that we want first years to be operating at. So at least they have that understanding. A um, little bit like here, but you know, I've been quite around quite a lot of ceramics factories and getting this sense of materials. 
Dudson's do a really nice factory tour online um, as well. And then again, the materials that are used in that. So again, that iterate, or the, the kind of repetition, not iteration, but the repetition of kind of using these terminologies in the second week. And digging it. So going to dig it and uh, something I've been interested in for quite a number of years now, but again, on the back of this idea of about sustainability and the ecological impact is actually saying to students straight up front, you could be doing projects in your third year, which is just about process. So kind of saying that very early on, that it could be around the material. And Tony's laughing now because again, so it's your fault, is it? <laughs> um, funny you should say that, Tony, because <laughs> I, I think it was on a previous slide, but I'll, I'll check. I'm not sure where it is in there. Um, but yeah, I've done quite a few projects which, which look at Stoke, which look at kind of the mining history of it and given people a kind of understanding of that. That was very much a site-specific one to that. One of the first buildings in the UK to use core 10 steel um, in its architecture. So it was very much around that as well. And then I've dug up lots of London in various locations in school playgrounds. You know, the first time I said to a, a head teacher, do you mind if I dig a hole in your school? She was like, no, that'd be really interesting. I wonder what'll happen. I said, I've no idea, let's just do it. Uh, we couldn't get the kids out of there, literally. And they were finding stones and they were coming up and going, look at this. And it's like, yeah, it's a stone. Now go away and ask your science teacher about that. So that idea about putting clay in every single part of the curriculum, I've done it several times now. Um, but the, yeah, the fascination, these kids have never dug a hole. I think I spent my early years just doing that. Um, this, this idea about earth exchange. So about bringing your own piece of land. Um, okay, we've given it a name, but bringing this and creating projects through this. This was one I was really lucky to be involved with, with 55 young European theatre producers and directors, and just putting cl clay centre stage. It wasn't what they'd come to do. All I asked them to do was bring a kilo of clay. Um, go and dig it. I don't want you to buy it from a supplier. And we got all these wonderful kind of colours that came in from these um, with six different groups because it was us as well. Um, and created a project around that. And then some stamps. And we did some firings as well. Uh, students, we, we set them a challenge to bring a kilo of clay on the first day. So wherever they're coming from in the world, bring us a kilo of clay, of your home clay. And that allows us to take them through the processing of it. It was really interesting this year because it didn't go out in our welcome letter and it caused havoc with the first kind of, the first project in the first three weeks because they hadn't got it there. Um, so yeah, we've, we'll make sure that's in next year. Uh, sorry, that was the Thames Tideway. So that's a huge, huge tunnel um, to take sewage away from the Thames, basically. So it's this new super sewer, basically, that's, that's helping London in the next 200 years, hopefully. Um, but again, getting to students the idea that all clay isn't soft when it comes out of the ground. Um, a lot of it is kind of hard won. This is one of Javier's um, projects. Also, the idea about creating projects, large-scale, um, these are two fine artists, Heather Aykroyd and Dan Harvey, and the only materials in play here, the whole interior of this deconsecrated church was lined with clay and grass seed, and then just watered on a daily basis. And it was a very much a performative piece or immersive kind of piece, but the way the interior grew over three months was just extraordinary. It was such a, an amazing feeling to go into this space and be surrounded um, by this. And the idea that you know clay isn't just about making stuff. It's in paint production, 
Wine clarification, I'm pleased to say. Uh, the, the kind of leather process, medicines, it's in rubber, uh, it's in, you know, dog litter. Now, ball bearings, the new production is ceramic because they're finding they last a lot longer than metal ones. Uh, high performance textiles, particularly fire retardant, and as we know, crucibles for melting metal in. So this idea that clay is in lots of other things, it isn't just about making objects. And you may or may not know, I hope you know, what, what, what two materials, paper and a pencil. So I'll leave you with that one till the end. Or do you know? Do you know? Conrad, what a top man. There you go. Where's the clay and a pencil? There you go. Did you all know that? Nobody spoke up though, did you? Okay. So yeah, it's this, I hadn't worked it out for years, you know, okay, it's graphite in a pencil, and yeah, there's wood, there's wood in both, uh, and as we know, it's the fine, you know, it's the finest papers are coated with, with um, kaolin, but I didn't, I didn't realise for years, until about 10 years ago, that it was actually the stuff that held, and the higher it's been fired. So that idea that graphite is fired into clay and put into a pencil. Uh, there is a fantastic YouTube um, production of a pencil. And we also know it got the space shuttle up into space and helped it come through the Earth's atmosphere. Because this underbelly, which was a bit hot, uh, allowed it to re-enter and not to have to land in the sea to cool down. Um, but yeah, I remember as a kid just seeing that battered space capsule coming back down and hitting the ocean. And just in that short period, in a sense. And the, I remember the kerfuffle, if you know that word, uh, of a tile coming loose where somebody had to get out and fix the tile. That was big news for a month. You know, ceramic tile in space has to be refitted. Um, so yeah, how are we doing for time? Okay, I might whiz through these for you. Uh, found that in a magazine, a fashion magazine, Bentonite versus Kaolin. The fuck's that all about? <laughs> it's like, what's going on here? And it, obviously, it was about makeup. It was about what, the, what were the best products to put in makeup. Um, so yeah, it's just great to find things in other places. Also, these these Peruvian parrots, macaws. Um, through kind of self-assessment, and obviously seeing a lot of birds dead on the floor, they realised before they could feed and feast on the red berries, they had to line their stomachs with clay. So that idea of kaolin and morphine medicines, how we kind of ingest kaolin whenever we can. We know it's in toothpaste. We know we have it in our mouths every morning. Um, but I love, I, I really enjoy finding out that fact about these um, parrots. Ever seen those before? Potter wasps, cool, aren't they? Making pots, coming back to the nest and doing a bit of coiling or spitting or however they've done it. Um, making projects with other people where we put clay in every single part of a secondary school, a secondary school which um, 250 students who are deaf, but putting clay into every single subject. And this was about performance, this was about trust but it was a, a movement artist coming in, doing a day session and just seeing the wedging process, the kneading process. And he said, I'm done. I said, hold on, we've got another two days to go. This was like a, a kind of workshop. And he said, no, I know what I'm gonna work with for, for like the whole term and that building trust in this community. And it was about seeing how far they could extend this student before they had to pull her back into it. So again, just really surprising things about our process that can be in other, other kind of disciplines, other subjects. Building, reminding students in the school that bricks, clay, one of my favorite objects in ceramics of all time is just a brick. Um, but building a clay animation, a stop frame animation on a wall of this city growing uh, was an extraordinary piece of work. 
But again, working with different people, working outside the Olympic Stadium, working in the V&A, and then playground practice. I'll whiz through this, but this is um, a project, an Olympic project, where I wanted to collect as many of the world's clays, those who were competing in the 2012 Olympics in London. And I got this close for it to be in the welcome pack that a country bought to say, we're here. We're here for two weeks and then we'll leave. But what do we leave behind apart from these cultural memories? Um, but the Olympic Organising Committee, in their wisdom, just wouldn't push it over the line, literally. Um, so it didn't, it didn't happen in that way, but it happened through Clayground, where we, we connected with um, 84 countries. And it wasn't so much about the material, it was the stories that came with them. So we collected the narratives, we collected the individual stories about how that clay was collected, who helped to collect it, what was the journey like on its kind of uh, return, and that's the clay. It's ridiculous to kind of name land in that way, but that's what we do with borders, don't we? That's what we do with countries. It's nice to see that shifting, um, or to at least challenge that, the notion of borders. Uh, clay on the, the right, on the left fired. So the idea that all those clays disappear. And I like that idea about um, that kind of colour of the land disappearing in a way. Uh, one of our favourite collectors, Terry Knoll, who just happened to go around the world with a steel melodeon band. But his first question when landing somewhere was, take me to your local clay. He loved this idea of, rather than take me to your leader, it's like, just take me to some local clay. So again, getting, getting the material in different places. Uh, the Hingle River in Pakistan, Shaz Yagorji, who's a theatre producer, uh, out there collecting clay. And then who knew clay samples would be so interesting to a public? I had no idea. Uh, this is at the um, Institute of Making. It used to be called the Institute of Materials in London. Um, where they have every single material known to us. They have samples of everything. Uh, and they asked us to do a weekend there um, with the public, which was fantastic. I thought like 10 people would turn up. Uh, it was rammed. And that's us showing what those materials, we had the other materials which were raw and then showing them what it was like with fired. But again, that fascination around material Uh, yeah, it's just showing that one. And something you've done, collecting sherds from the Thames Foreshore. Mike with his collection, or some of it. Um, it's got a lot more. And then the conversations you can have with other people through process and material. This is working with somebody called Roger Kneebone, who's a surgical educator. Um, it's at Imperial College in London. But talking about haptics, talking about hand skills, the importance of this, and he's introduced now a ceramics module into surgeons education at Imperial College, because he said academically the students coming in were off the scale, like you couldn't choose between them, they'd all got A stars in every subject they'd ever done. Put a scalpel in their hand, fucking useless, absolutely crap. So his big push in recent years is to put practical subjects back into our secondary education, back into the curriculum, because they've disappeared. Um, so he's saying it's literally a, latter, a matter, he says a matter of life and death. You don't want a surgeon who's never touched a tool before the first time he's operating. Um, and it was fascinating and central to bring 15 surgeon, trainee surgeons, fifth year medical students, along with our first years, it could be first years, second years, and third years, to make together. And there we are doing it together. Um, I'm going to end, uh, we've got another kind of 10 minute schedule, but we'll just flip through these. But again, that thing about showing the public material and kind of having that as starting point rather than an object to start that discussion, actually having the materials on show of finding a way of communicating that um, to people to kind of spread the, spread the joy of our subject. 
And that's the World Clays Fired on Saggers, which was a project I developed for Stoke-on-Trent. And then again, fire is, you know, building kilns. Uh, Marcia has talked about building a kiln. Uh, <laughs> oh, Marcia, uh, over in traffic. But this idea of, like, community kilns and Saggers and the industry in Stoke. And then just having that celebration through firing. So again, this idea of showing students right from the beginning that because our course is up to them where they take the material and their ideas, it's showing them straight away. It can just be very simple. It can also be very complex. They can end up after three years with almost a kind of an MA in research, you know, if they really take the material on. Um, but they can also treat it on this level of, of kind of not a fired object, but then it could be something they, they talk about performance about. Building kilns by canals, by other canals, using waste product from the Burley factory uh, in Stoke-on-Trent to build the kiln. And then as you've done kind of walking along the Thames foreshore and thinking about kind of London's place in, in kind of import-export, but in history um, since Roman times. And my last question is, do you have potholes in your rope? Do you know what potholes are? Do you, do you have any potholes? What do you, what do you call holes in roads? And don't say you don't have them. Don't say that. What's that? What's, and what's the, word, what's, what's the translation? It is a pothole. Marcia in Portugal? Just holes. Not potholes. Oslo? Just holes. <laughs> It isn't, but the only reason we call them potholes is because there are magistrate records from the 15, 1600s of potters being fined for digging holes in the road because you look at a puddle, you think, ah, good bit of clay there. So I'll follow that puddle out into the field. So they'll dig from that point. And they were fined for not digging in the original hole because the stagecoach had come along and... <laughs> so hence we in our country have potholes. Because, yes, they did blame the local potters. So, uh, yeah, I'll wrap that up there. Uh, but that's how we kind of introduced this material. And I'd, I'd be fascinated because it's changed so many... You know, the original one was quite full, kind of very formal. Um, sometimes I split this in half because if I can see students just kind of... Well, I don't do it after lunch, basically. I do it first thing in the morning. Um, <laughs> because it is a tricky slot. But, um, yeah, that's the way I introduce it to stage one in their second week. Not to give them... to give them. Hopefully there's enough information there that they go away and ask questions about, but also in different areas, because it gets students talking about their interests. Because um, what I haven't shown in that really is objects, have I? It's not about... For us, it's not about that. It's early days for them just to cry, you know, try and create this kind of curiosity about not just one clay, the clays we have in the department, we've got five clays in the department, but to have a kind of, um, yeah, to kind of hopefully uh, get their curiosity going. Yeah? Okay, thank you very much. That'll do. There you go.